The Easter Rising of 1916 saw Irish rebels take up arms in Dublin. Almost 500 people died in the violence that followed, the majority of them civilian bystanders. But overwhelming British forces quickly and ruthlessly put down the rebellion. Although defeated, the rebels regrouped, recruited and prepared for a new guerrilla campaign. A disturbing aspect of the violence between the years 1919 and 1921 was the fate of civilians deliberately killed by the IRA. Were they spies? Were they informers? Some were, some were not. They were abducted, executed and buried in unmarked graves or weighed down and dumped into lakes and rivers. They are the forgotten victims of Ireland's struggle for independence. I've spent the last decade researching the dead of the Irish Revolution. During that time, I've encountered the cases of many people who were abducted and executed by the IRA, put to death for suspected collusion, often on the flimsiest of evidence. In some cases, we don't even know the names of victims, let alone their whereabouts. In the intervening years, most of these victims have been conveniently forgotten, their names lost in a maze of records. In this series, I'll visit various parts of the country to explore the fate of some of these disappeared. For me, their deaths at the hands of the IRA cast a very dark shadow over the history of the independence struggle. We're now entering a decade of commemorations, marking the centenary of key events in recent Irish history. 1916, partition, independence and civil war. We should commemorate the courage of the men and women who fought for Ireland, but it's now time that we looked at darker aspects of the independence struggle. I grew up listening to dramatic stories of the war of independence and civil war, told to me by my two grandmothers. These were family stories. My grandfathers were senior IRA officers. My mother's mother, Cathy Barry, was a leading anti-treaty activist. Two of my great uncles were killed. Kevin Barry was hanged in Dublin in November 1920. Paddy Maloney was shot dead outside Tipperary town in May 1921. Crown forces killed many people in very dubious circumstances during the conflict. So too did the IRA. But the treatment of alleged spies is perhaps the most disturbing aspect of the IRA's campaign. I want to identify some of those who disappeared between 1919 and 1923 and to find out why they were killed. Following the suppression of the 1916 Rising, popular support for the independence campaign began to harden. By the time of their sweeping victory in the general election of 1918, Sinn Féin demanded nothing short of full independence for all of Ireland. British intransigence ensured that armed conflict became inevitable. What followed tore the country apart. The War of Independence was, however, only the prelude to an even more bitter conflict. Following the partition of the country and the signing of the treaty in London, the country became polarised. The subsequent civil war scarred the new Irish state. What's notable about the years 1919 to 1923 is that protagonists from all sides engaged in acts contrary to the conventions of war. And for the IRA, one of their lasting legacies was that of the disappeared. In 1920 and 1921, at least 200 people were abducted, executed, and their bodies secretly disposed of by the IRA. These included over 180 civilians, as well as policemen and soldiers. Who were these victims? Hard facts about actual civilian and British casualties during the conflict are hard to come by. Even the normally thorough British authorities couldn't account for all of their personnel. Many families who suffered the disappearance of a loved one 
never had a body to bury or a chance to grieve properly or commemorate their loss. But at a lonely spot in the Dublin mountains lies a memorial to one well-known casualty whose hidden remains were recovered. He was one of the last victims of the Civil War, the older brother of future Taoiseach Sean Lamass. Noel Lamass was abducted in Dublin in June 1923 by government agents. Four months later, his badly mutilated body was found up here in this remote spot in the Dublin mountains. This was one of many murders committed by both sides during and immediately after the Civil War. Sean Lamass knew his brother's killers, but he never sought revenge. At least the Lamass family eventually recovered Noel's remains. For scores of other Irish and British families, there never was a body to mourn. But the memory of those others secretly killed and buried hasn't entirely faded. The graves of disappeared civilians, police and soldiers are the subject of local stories and folklore all across Ireland. One place where locals say secret burials took place is in a quiet corner of County Leash. Ashbrook Farm was formerly owned by a Quaker family, the Walpoles. The last of the family to work the farm was Jack Walpole. In the decades after the conflict, stories circulated that Jack had found a body on his land and subsequently buried it. John Carroll, the current owner of the farm, met Jack Walpole on a number of occasions. John, how are you? Yeah. Well, Thanks. Come on in. Thank you. The Walpoles lived from the time it was built in 1772 uh, up to 1938 and my father bought it. And can you tell us a bit about Jack Walpole? He was a bit eccentric. He left here and he built a dance hall in Burris and Osley. Yeah. That wasn't a commercial success so he went off to live in England. And you met him? I met him and I asked him the story about because as a kid we always heard about a body being buried on a field beside the road and he says there were actually three of them, and he buried one of them himself. Good, just step on, step on. So the following year, he was ploughing over the grave, and the horse totally refused to go over the grave. Go, girls. That's it. Did you feel he had told this story before, or was this the first time? It's the first time I ever heard it. He thought that they were executed. He thought they were from Tipperary. I asked him why did he think they were thrown into his place. Yeah. And he said he thought because he was a Quaker that they would have respected the bodies. Really? And buried them. Have you looked at the site since? I don't know where the site is exactly now. I, have a, I, I think I have a rough idea where it might be. But you had heard about it as a kid, so obviously locally there was some knowledge. Well, there was because the man that um, buried the body was a local, and he obviously told people. Right. And do you know who he was? He was a labourer here, wasn't he? He was, yes. John Phelan was his name. I wonder why, why Jack thought they were from Tipperary, what made him think that? I don't know, he didn't say. Whether there was some identification of on, on them or what, I don't know. Was he credible? Did you believe him? Oh, I believed him then, yes. I didn't think that he, he would invent a story about the horse. Jack Walpole told John that he found the body near an old forge on the boundary of his farm. The man had been shot. He dragged the body into the adjoining field where he buried it. If Walpole is to be believed, two other bodies were discovered on separate occasions and also buried on his farm. To try to get to the bottom of this story, we've commissioned the services of an archaeological firm based in Cork, with wide experience in exhuming human remains. John Carroll has kindly granted them permission to carry out excavations on his land. Colin, I'm delighted that you're getting involved in this. I, mean, I don't know what we'll find up in Ashbrook. 
I've no really idea of the sort of scientific end of things, so that's up to you. Yeah, well, we're, we're really interested in getting involved in it. It sounds like an amazing project. Um, it's, it's right down our, our street. Um, as you can see, we've, we've lots of uh, skeletal remains, skeletons, in these boxes here, and uh, it's, it's the kind of thing we would be used to dealing with. One of our team, Carmelita Troy, is an osteoarchaeologist, and she's analysing some human remains upstairs, so we could just go up and have a look and see, see what she's analysing. It might give us an idea of what we find. Yeah, sure. If human remains are uncovered in Ashbrook, osteoarchaeology will be vital in helping us identify the sex, age, and most importantly, the cause of the death of the individual. Um, here we have a skeleton from a Bronze Age cemetery in Moon County Kildare. It was a young adult male, but there was no obvious trauma to result in its death. However, we have a skull here. The individual died as a result of sharp force trauma, which is caused by an object with an edge or a point, which usually penetrates the skull. We have a minimum of eight wounds, all with evidence of healing, at least three penetrating the skull. If we were to find skeletons yeah. um, on this project, it would be probable to find a skeleton with trauma identifiable. The field where John Carroll believes the bodies are buried stretches to over 30 acres. This is obviously a huge area and will be a massive task to completely survey and excavate. However, based on his conversations with Jack Walpole, John has identified two possible locations for the burials. One is close to the old forge where Walpole claimed to have found the first body. The other is in a spot called Nell's Hill. Fairly good idea just from talking with John and also from the uh, from the preliminary work that we've done, kind of where we're, where we're going to target and where we're going to have a go at first. Right. And so is it here or is it going to be? We're going to just kind of work our way down by the by the fence line here and uh, see if we can uh, pick up some, some evidence for, for disturbance. Because Ashbrook has been active farmland for centuries, evidence of soil disturbance is to be found everywhere. However, Using sophisticated geophysical survey technology allows the archaeologists to pinpoint particular areas of interest worthy of further investigation. What we're trying to do is we're trying to narrow the parameters. We've got this huge, big field. We're trying to use a bit of logic about where to go and where to look for the, you know, where would the bodies be. If we start first and we look at the Nels Hill site. That's that one. Yeah. That's, that's that one here, yeah. Um, you can see immediately there's, a, there's a, an area of heavy disturbance. They're uh, features that we would call in archaeological terms as kind of pit-like features. Mm -hmm. And certainly if you can imagine a kind of a shallow grave is, is basically a pit. So that, that's a very promising um, anomaly for us. So we'd, we'd want to target that straight away. And of course, if we look over then at the, uh, at the, uh, the old forge site, again, we're going from the into the open pasture here. And again, the same as the other site, we have a lot of these anomalies. These, right. So that we have targets that we're going to go for again. We're told that somewhere in this expansive field lie the remains of two executed men. The fact that the archaeologists have identified so many potential burial sites is encouraging. But the question is, can they bring us any closer to the truth? On a farm in County Leash, archaeologists are searching for the remains of two men alleged to have been executed and secretly buried during the independence era. Their investigations are based on local rumours and claims made by the late owner of the farm, Jack Walpole. There's a tooth. I reckon it's sheep. What do you think? Animal rather than human anyway. Yeah. Earlier when we were talking to Eunan in the, in the tent, we mentioned this very strong anomaly that we got uh, up here at Nels Hill. And we just opened up a trench over it. Uh, we initially found a layer of lime, which we got very excited about because we thought it might have been deposited over a body to help decompose the body. Um, it turns out that it's actually a lime kiln, a beautiful feature. Unfortunately, it's not what we're looking for today, but again, it just points out that the technology works, and it works really well. My search for the identities of the alleged victims buried on Ashbrook Farm took me back to Dublin, to the National Archives. Even with the cooperation of the killers, as has sometimes happened after the recent Northern Ireland troubles, it has proved tremendously difficult to find the bodies that disappeared. With the passage of 90 years, it becomes almost impossible. Whatever the chances of actually finding human remains on the farm in Leash, can we at least begin to hazard a guess as to who might have been buried there?
Jack Walpole didn't know the identities of the men whom he buried. However, he did think that they came from Tipperary. Research here in the National Archives indicates that two men did disappear from North Tipperary in 1921-22. They were abducted and never seen again. This was J.J. Fitzsimons of Thurlis and Joseph Coonan of Clock Jordan. Could these be the men buried at Ashbrook? Files on both of these men are locked away in the National Archives, but are closed to the public. However, I've applied to have them released and await a decision from the Department of Justice. Some files that are available make for interesting reading. They highlight how inconsistent the IRA were in handling individual cases of buried victims. Take the example of Major Geoffrey Compton Smith, a distinguished officer, twice wounded during the Great War. He was abducted and executed by the IRA in Cork in 1921. Five years later, his body was returned. His remains were accorded full military honours by the Irish state. His file even contains details of the costs incurred in handling his remains. Why was it that the Cork IRA were willing to return the body of a British soldier like Compton Smith, but not the remains of many others whom they disappeared in much the same manner? Perhaps the answer lies here within the National Archives. Unfortunately, thousands of Department of Defence and Department of Justice files remain closed. Ninety years on, it's surely time that we knew what these contained. The families of the dead and the public generally have a right to know how and why these people died. In the wake of the Civil War, one man deeply committed to the achievement of Irish independence threw a harsh light on some of the less noble aspects of the Republican campaign. Patrick Sarsfield O'Hegarty, a stalwart of the early years of the Sinn Féin movement, was fiercely critical of the IRA campaign after 1918. In his book, The Victory of Sinn Féin, published just a year after the Civil War, he paints a very bleak picture. Sean? Yes. Well, the men of 1916 were idealists. Men who were in the movement from conviction and not as a result of an emotional wave. Men who had consecrated their lives to Ireland from a sense of duty and patriotism. Their leaders would never have agreed to the beastly things that were done afterwards. The men of 1918 to 1921 were different. They included for the first time the gunman and the irresponsible and the moral degenerate. People whose nationalism was founded neither in knowledge nor conviction, but in the parrot cry of up the republic. They included a proportion of men who had not been out in 1916 and who afterwards wished they had, and felt they had to be violent and extreme in order to make up for their failure as they had come to regard it in 1916. They looked down on the 1916 men as amateurs and bunglers. Then the 1922 men came along as a third layer. They were the people who had not been out before that and who now wished they had and were the product of years of war and unrest and moral loosening we had had. They looked down on all their predecessors as babes and when they themselves got going, they made them look like babes. We have been living under what was practically a military terrorism in which a civilian government existed merely as a machine for registering military decrees and under which every argument, save the gun, was eliminated. P.S. O'Hegarty's words were written shortly after the Civil War. No doubt his views of the conduct of the Republican struggle were coloured by the tragedy of Irishmen fighting Irishmen. However, we can't discount everything that O'Hegarty says. In the battle for supremacy between the IRA and the Crown forces, Thousands of civilians were made homeless and hundreds killed. It was a period of lawlessness and chaos. The IRA ran their own courts. The Royal Ash Constabulary came under heavy attack. The War of Independence saw almost 900 of its members killed or wounded. Many others, fearing for their lives, resigned. The level of violence varied dramatically across Ireland. Leash was relatively quiet during the War of Independence, with less than a dozen fatalities. Whereas across the border in Tipperary, there were numerous ambushes, official reprisals and executions. 
The IRA often suffered setbacks, with local leadership blaming these on spies and informants. It appears that they had some cause for concern. I'm standing here in Madrini in Tipperary. Today it's a scenic crossroads. In June 1921, it was the site of a famous ambush when men of the North Tipperary Flying Column under Sean Gaynor attacked a mixed British force, killing four and wounding 14. The famous IRA organizer Ernie O'Malley described the involvement of a spy in the Madrini ambush in his book, Raids and Rallies. According to O'Malley, a farmer, an ex-soldier, mistook the IRA column for Crown forces. Kitted out in trench coats and Sam Brown belts, it was an easy mistake to make. Elsewhere in Ireland, others had made the same fatal error. The commanding officer, Sean Gaynor, greeted the farmer and maintained the charade. Before long, the farmer was enthusiastically telling Gaynor of his support for the British campaign against the IRA and how he himself had provided information to the local RIC. When he realized his mistake, it was too late. He was taken away to be shot. However, the IRA officers then decided to postpone shooting him until after the ambush, as gunfire might alert the incoming Crown forces. Writing of the Madrini incident, Ernie O'Malley outlines the difficult position IRA men often found themselves in when dealing with suspected informers. At times there was a reluctance to shoot spies. But they had no pity for this informer who has so casually and cheerfully implicated men with the column that morning. Nor was it intended to refer his case to Dublin. At that time, any evidence given at a court-martial of a spy and the sentence imposed had to be forwarded to General Headquarters in Dublin, where the evidence would be re-examined and the sentence confirmed or remitted. In the meantime, a convicted spy had to be closely guarded, which entailed strain and constant alertness on the part of his captors. A daring spy would be more ready to chance a break for freedom. And his guards ran the additional risk of identification if surprised by an enemy raiding party. O'Malley says that during the chaos of the ambush, the spy escaped. He doesn't name him, but could he have been one of our two missing North Tipperary men, JJ Fitzsimons or Joseph Coonan? All O'Malley says is that the spy found refuge in a local barracks and later fled to England. By the summer 1920, the introduction of the Black and Tans and Auxiliaries put the IRA under increasing pressure. The auxiliaries were particularly aggressive, taking the battle to their IRA opponents. The increasing success of these new units led the IRA to believe that they were privy to good information provided by local spies and informants. Local IRA units now took the matter into their own hands, ignoring the procedures for handling spies as laid down by General Headquarters. In 1990, a man's body was discovered in a bog outside Turraheen, South Tipperary. According to local historians, the victim was abducted early in 1921, tried, convicted, shot dead and buried where his body was found. This was Thomas Kirby, a man in his 40s who'd been abducted and shot in 1921. Apparently he'd been discharged as a soldier 20 years earlier as, quote, a harmless lunatic. Ty Dwyer, an IRA officer, provided the Bureau of Military History with an account of Kirby's killing. Towards the end of 1920, it became clear to us that the British forces were getting information concerning the houses and places frequented by men on the run. An ex-British soldier named Thomas Kirby was suspected of spying in order to leave the area. He joined the British forces and returned to the barracks at Dundrum, from where he guided the enemy parties on their nightly prowls for wanted men. Although he always disguised himself whenever he left the barracks with the enemy parties, he was soon recognised. Then one night he ventured out alone and was followed and captured at a public house in Ballybrack near Anacarty where he was drinking. He was tried by court martial but could offer no satisfactory explanation for his movements.
To the charge of spying for enemy forces, he pleaded insanity. He was sentenced to death and executed by a firing party. Before his death, we brought a priest to him who anointed him and gave him all spiritual aid. We buried him up in the hills near Ballybrack. Kirby's execution took place on or about the 8th of January, 1921. Like Kirby, most of those secretly killed ended up buried in a bog or field. But their deaths were mercifully quick. For an unfortunate few, their end was far more inhumane. Their arms and legs bound, they were dumped alive into rivers or lakes. As the conflict intensified from the autumn of 1920, in some areas the IRA became obsessed with spies and informers. Many people were killed on the merest whiff of suspicion. Others were attacked essentially for local reasons unconnected with the national struggle. In some cases, we simply don't know. Take the tragic case of Martin Heavey. Heavey was a 30-year-old ex-serviceman living in Brideswell, Ballynamona, Roscommon, about seven miles from Athlone. On the night of 30 December 1920, he was abducted, along with his elderly mother and other members of his family, by mass members of the IRA's South Roscommon Brigade. In the midst of winter, they were held in various locations, including a cattle shed and an abandoned house, before being separated. Ultimately, Heavey's family were rowed away across the Shannon and told not to return to their home. Heavey's sister described how the raiders pretended they were Crown forces and asked Martin for information about the IRA. Martin said he couldn't give any, but this didn't save him. The IRA sentenced Heavey to death. While they were waiting for a priest to minister to him, soldiers were spotted nearby, but the group escaped by boat. Heavey was thrown into the Shannon, bound and gagged. His body was never found. Ten members of the brigade were arrested by Crown forces in January 1921 and charged in relation to the events. A number of the men were identified by Heavey's mother. As her son's remains were never recovered, the IRA men could only be charged with his kidnapping. Successful prosecution in cases like these was extremely rare. This one was possible only because of the courage of Heavey's mother and his sister in giving evidence. But for the Heavey family, justice was limited, as only months later, following the signing of the treaty, Martin's killers were released. For the new state, his case, like so many others, was conveniently forgotten. During the War of Independence and Civil War, the actions of some members of the IRA did much to damage the Republican cause. Events like the abduction and execution of four unarmed British soldiers near Cork City on the eve of the truce left even ardent supporters of the independence struggle sickened. Writer and Sinn Féin member P.S. O'Hegarty was damning of these kind of brutal killings. When it was open to volunteer combatants to order the shooting of any civilian and to cover himself with the laconic legend spy on the dead man's breast, personal security vanished and no man's life was safe. And when it was possible for the same combatant to steal goods and to legalize it by calling it commandeering, or to burn and destroy goods and to legalize that by saying they were Belfast or English goods, then social security vanished. With the vanishing of reason and principle and morality, we became a mob, and a mob we remained. And for the mob, there's only one law, gun law. So the gunman became supreme, and the only thing which counted in Ireland in anything was force. For the spirit of the gunman invaded everything, not politics alone. As the war lengthened, it became more brutal and more savage, Open up! and more hysterical, Open up! and more unrelievedly black. O'Hegarty paints a bleak picture. The civilian population were terrorized into silence. The justice system had collapsed. Witnesses would not risk the wrath of the IRA. 
and whatever justice existed was administered by IRA courts with no right of appeal. A police report from Galway gives a good account of the impact the IRA campaign was having. The majority of the people are afraid to be seen associating with the Crown forces, and they are also afraid to give the forces of the Crown any information which might lead to the extermination of this band of outlaws. Swift vengeance on the part of the IRA follows those who were even suspected of giving the police any information. And so long as this reign of terror continues, the country will be in a disturbed and unsatisfactory condition. The RIC suffered the most casualties at IRA hands. In March 1920, Constables Charles Healy and James Rock were shot dead as they left devotions here at this church in Tomb of Ara in Tipperary. They were the first police to be killed leaving a religious service, but they weren't to be the last. In fact, my own grandfather, Jim Maloney, took part in the killing of Constable John Notley at Bansha and Tipperary as he left Mass in May 1921. Tobias O'Sullivan was the district inspector based in Lestole. In January 1921, as he walked home, he held his five-year-old son John by the hand. This did not deter his killers, and he was shot down in a hail of bullets. And what about 20-year-old RIC Constable Alfred Needham, who, having just exchanged vows with his bride, was shot dead in front of her? The killing took place on the eve of the truce. Fear of such attacks may explain why these auxiliaries took no chances when attending their captain's wedding. With the breakdown of law and order, the RIC increasingly took matters into their own hands, carrying out reprisals, setting up death squads, and burning homes and businesses. My great-grandfather's pharmacy in Tipperary Town was burnt by mass policemen in November 1920 in reprisal for an IRA attack the previous day. The Black and Tans are generally blamed for such activities, but in reality, it was the regular local police who told them where to strike. In his memoirs, former RIC inspector John Regan acknowledged police involvement in violent reprisals. Quote, those police quickest to avenge a dead comrade were Irishmen, and men of an excellent type. In their barracks, the RIC were a force under siege. While IRA propaganda might lead one to believe that this was a war against the British, that wasn't so. Yes, we're gonna get the bastards. They were also killing Irishmen. The RIC bore the brunt of their attacks. In these conditions, a tit-for-tat cycle of violence developed between the IRA and RIC. It was the civilian population which often suffered as a result. So could some of these civilian victims have ended up buried in a field in Leash? So far, the archaeologists' search for two bodies reportedly buried on Ashbrook Farm in County Leash has yielded nothing. However, when I revisited the site, I met a neighbouring farmer who added yet another layer to this mystery. I've just spoken to a local who prefers not to be identified. He told me a story that a labourer did find a body in a ditch and reburied it, but it was on the other side of the farm. We identified the field in question, but decided to continue to concentrate our efforts on the sites that John Carroll had suggested. Can you tell me what's happening here? Um, we got some more information yesterday from John Carroll. He seemed to think that the burial was up here on the brow of the hill. So we got Jonsky back with the geophys equipment. Uh, he scanned the whole area, and he came up with two very strong anomalies. So we've opened trenches over them, and as you can see here, we've got a very obvious feature straight away. Uh, you can see it here, a very kind of black feature, kind of jumping out of the, the, the ground. And this is a great candidate for a, for a burial, so we're kind of we're very excited about this one. So you can see it here, it's very clear. Big dark area, so this is... This is a pit feature, yeah. Runs in there a bit. Runs in under, so we'll have to kind of maybe extend the trench slightly to kind of get the full, the full extent of it. Yeah. 
As I stood watching Colm peel back the layers of soil, John Carroll, the owner of Ashbrook, joined me. We wondered if the story of the burials would finally be proved true. I'm afraid, Union, we've uh, drawn a blank. We've we've been excavating the anomaly here, as you can see behind us. Yeah. Got a little bit excited. We found a bit of bone, bit of bone but yeah. yeah, it just uh, turned out to be animal, and that's it. We've now uh, we've kind of tested every single anomaly that we have. Unfortunately, we found nothing. Yeah. Uh, other than the kiln, of course. And, and bits of iron. And bits of iron. Yeah. <laughs> Lots of bits of iron. Naturally, we were all disappointed not finding any human remains, though we knew from the outset that the odds were against us. I suppose over the course of two days when you're dealing with an area the size of this, 30 acres, it, it, it's always going to be a long shot as to whether you can find what would be a very, very small grave in that area. It by no means is definitive evidence that there's no graves here. They could quite easily be. John, do you think Jack Paul Paul was right? Oh, I would say the story he told was true. Right. But as I say, because it's such an extensive area, it's difficult to find a needle in a haystack. While it's extremely challenging to find the remains of IRA victims buried long ago, there's no difficulty at all in finding material in the military archives that reveal the terrible trauma that families of the missing endured. OK, Unit, so I have that file from the Collins collection. Great. So if you wouldn't mind putting on those gloves, please, okay. Unit. And here is the Hackett file itself. Great, excellent. If you do have any questions, I'll be excited. Yeah. The Michael Collins collection contains documents relating to the new Department of Defence and Free State Army. Within these files are papers concerning inquiries into persons executed and secretly buried and correspondence with their families. It's virtually impossible in most cases to determine if people shot as spies by the IRA were in fact guilty. What we do know is that the families of the disappeared were often very callously treated. Take the case of Michael Hackett, an ex-soldier he was arrested by the IRA on the 15th of May 1921, accused of giving information which had led to the deaths of three IRA volunteers near Boris. He was executed on the 1st of June 1921 and secretly buried. His mother, Julia Hackett, found out about his fate only through an anonymous letter. Dear Mrs. Hackett, pleased to inform you that your son Mike was shot and buried in Crean Wood. Five bullets put through him by some boys out of his own town. There was no use keeping you in darkness any longer. Get him prayed for. A heartbroken Julia Hackett immediately sought help from the government to retrieve her son's remains. They in turn requested information from the Carlo IRA and were told that after receiving the rites of the Catholic Church, Hackett was shot as a spy and buried in consecrated grounds. This blatant lie was exposed months later when Michael Hackett's body was discovered on the side of a mountain. His distraught mother later wrote, I cannot see how the consecration comes in on top of a mountain, four miles from a churchyard. General Headquarters now sought the truth about what actually happened to Michael Hackett. The local IRA changed their story, insisting that Hackett had been part of a network of paid spies operating in Carlow, whose information led to the death of a number of IRA men. The Carlow IRA further claimed that Hackett was not buried in consecrated grounds, as they'd originally stated, because this might have alerted other spies whom the IRA wished to capture. Their report ended cruelly with them stating that although Hackett had been allowed half an hour's audience with the priest, he had refused the opportunity to make his last confession. The manner in which the Carlo IRA changed their story about Hackett doesn't give much confidence in their accusations against him. The 1911 census shows that Hackett at 17 couldn't even read. As an illiterate ex-soldier, he was an obvious scapegoat for what may have been the IRA's own failings. It actually became an established pattern for local IRA leaders to blame spies and informants for their own shortcomings. Michael Hackett is but one of many victims executed on questionable grounds. Years after the conflict, IRA veterans openly admitted that many mistakes were made. People shot as spies weren't always guilty. This was acknowledged as early as the 1940s by the government's own Bureau of Military History. 
Among the civilians who were killed, there were a number whose bodies were found bearing a label with the word spy or similar inscription. It's understood that the implication in many such cases was unfounded. Although a member of the Irish Republican Brotherhood and Sinn Féin, PSO Hegarty believed that many killings were unjustified. He became increasingly disenchanted with how the IRA conducted its campaign. We set up irresponsible and inexperienced and unbalanced youths as brigadiers and OCs with power of life and death over whole counties. We glorified ambushes and stunts and jobs and secret executions without trial. We abolished all the ordinary laws of morality and of public decency and of social responsibility without setting up anything in their place save the exigencies of military policy interpreted by any irresponsible brigadier or OC. We created a situation wherein our civilization was ripe because of the weakening of the ordinary established safeguards for reversion to a primitive, unorganized society in which everything would depend upon force. While the archaeologists were frustrated in not finding human remains in Ashbrook, I had a little more luck. Earlier, I requested access to two closed files about men reported missing in North Tipperary in 1921-22, J.J. Fitzsimons and Joseph Coonan. The files are farcical rather than shocking. Coonan was a chancer. He was arrested and briefly imprisoned by the IRA for posing as one of them. As for Fitzsimons, he was reported missing simply because he was cheating his Dublin landlord. As both Tipperary men survived the conflict, they can be ruled out as possible victims buried on Jack Walpole's farm. It seems the burials will remain a mystery. In the next episode, I turn my attention to Cork, where the conflict was most fiercely fought. There, executions, secret burials and torture took on a sinister regularity. What it must have been like, brought here, probably knowing they're going to die. Oh yeah, it was a hot old chamber. And in all of Ireland, it was the Cork No. 1 Brigade which carried out the greatest number of secret killings. Even women and children were not spared. <laughs> <laughs>